Last time, we finished uh, Chaya Sarah. So now we're starting with a very powerful episode over here, which is Parshat Toldot, which talks about really the, the whole conflict that goes on between good and evil in this world. You know, this is where it starts over here. I mean, it already started before also with Adam Arishon and the snake and this and that, but now it takes its current format, which now until this day we have this format of good and evil. So uh, we'll, we'll try to see what, what that means. Right. First of all, it tells you that Yitzhak was coming from Abraham. Why is it t- telling you that? We already knew that already from the last parsha, right? That Yitzhak was the son of Abraham. So why is it coming telling you now? Again, Yitzhak is the son of Abraham. Thank you very much. I already knew that. So what? Uh, you're, you're trying to reinforce the, the point? So the point was, I say, Rabbi that the reason why they said this was because there was some jokers in that generation, you know? Some, uh, those gossip guys, you know? The gossip clown guys. Uh, so what they were saying is that what? That really, you know, the Yitzhak is not really the son of, of Abraham. Why? Because Abraham, all these years, he was married to Sarah, and he, was, he wasn't he was Zohet to have children with her for many, many years. And now all of a sudden they had children, you know, when he's 100 years old and she's 90. What kind of thing is that? That doesn't make any sense, you know. It's not real. It's, not, it's, it's a miracle. It's supernatural. So they said, you know, it must be, she probably got pregnant from Avimelech, you know, because Avimelech took her you know, uh, into his palace, and she had to spend the night over there with him and all that stuff. And we know that she came out over there, from, nothing happened over there, but they thought maybe something happened, you know, they were gossiping about it. And there's also, there was gossip going on, you know, a lot of gossip, like there is today, you know. They're thinking about this guy, what he did with this girl, with this, you know, all these things, you know. So the, they were saying, probably came from him, the son, it's not really the son of Abraham, came from Abimelech. And now they're trying to tell us, you know, that it came from, from Abraham. So what HaKadosh Baruch Hu was, he heard all this gossip, you know, all these rumors, he was listening to all these things. And so who said, listen, you know, let's, let's straighten it out once and for all. What I'm going to do is like this, right? I'm going to make Yitzhak look just like his father, like a twin, you know, twin brother. And when he's born, everybody's going to see, right? Looks just like him. So there's no way to mistake it, you know, and say it looks like somebody else. It must be that it comes from Abraham Avinu. So this is what he did, right? He made Yitzhak Avinu look exactly the features of his father. In order that nobody should now have any room to contest anymore, you know, these things and say, oh, you know, come from this, came from there, came from here, all these things. So now, right, the matter was already settled. Once the baby was born, they all saw, right, that there was no way to mistake one with the other. It was definitely his son, there was no question about it. This is the reason why uh, they, they, they said this, this Pasuk. So then it comes and says the Pasuk. Uh, so it says, right, that uh, Yitzhak was 40 years old when he took Rivka. So we already mentioned, right, that Rivka was 3 years old at this time, and he was 40. Can you imagine? This is kind of like a big age gap. Today this would be considered like, you know, to be like some kind of a, you know, they call that robbing the cradle, you know, whatever. That's the expression, you know, you're going, in, going for the kids, whatever. But it, it, it doesn't really, the truth is, right, that um, it doesn't really matter halacha, if there's an age discrepancy between a husband and wife, you're allowed to marry, uh, you know, uh, a girl who's much younger than you, and also you're allowed to marry a girl who's older than you as well. There's no, there's no limitation on halakha. But they do say one thing, right, when it comes to halakha, that even though you're allowed to marry somebody younger than you or older than you, that's true, but it shouldn't be that one of them is like a, you know, like a granny, you know, like a grandpa, you know, kind of thing. What does that mean? That he's not able to have children anymore, or whatever. It's kind of, you know, he's already too old. He doesn't have the strength to have children anymore. Or, or the woman is already like, you know, she's already past menopause, whatever, so she can't have children. So if it, in a case like that, you shouldn't marry a woman like that, because the whole point of getting married is to have children, you know, to do the mitzvah pu vu. So you're marrying somebody who's impossible to have children with, so what's the point, what'd you get married for? What, just for fun? To have some kind of a, a friend, you know, that's not, that's not what marriage is about. Kadosh Baruch Hu, the really, what really, what really interests him in this world for ma- is marriage, what's a, what's a, to have children, pu vu. That's the reason why people get married. According to Akadosh Baruch Hu, that's what's in, in his mind. He wants to bring more and more people in this world, right? More neshamot. Until all the neshamot come down. All the neshamot that he created have to come down into this world. And this is the reason why Akadosh Baruch Hu wants us to get married. Not just to, you know, to have some kind of a relationship and this and that. Some kind of fun and this and that. Fun you can have. Okay, you can also have fun. But that's not the reason why you get married. The reason is because you have to have children. You know, that's, that's the main thing. You just said that he wants to bring all the neshamot here. Right. Then you say previously that it's all Gilgul, 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 Gilgul. Make up your mind. It's all Gilgul, or he wants to get rid of the neshamot. <laughs> right, okay. Uh, well, so actually, I want to, you know what, I, first, before I answer you, I want to understand what your question is, because I don't really understand the contradiction between one and the other. The contradiction is very yeah. simple. Yeah. Stop the Gilgul, bring all the neshamot. Finish. 
Ah, oh, I see. Oh, okay. Now I got it. I got you. I got you. Okay, very good. So the answer is, uh, Jimmy, that um, Kadosh Baruch Hu requires the concept of Gilgul as well. Why is that? Because we need to make the Tikkun to finish our, our rectification. You understand? So if, if the rectification has not been done the first time, you have to do second time, third time, fourth time, so forth, so on, until everything is rectified, right? Say the Mekubalim, even a thousand times sometimes a person has to come back in order to rectify, to do every mitzvah. To do everything. Yeah. Uh, this is a very good question also, right? You guys have always the best questions. What can I tell you? We could just dedicate the whole, uh, you know, the whole uh, hour just for on these questions. Wonderful questions. Uh, so the answer is like this, right? That uh, your question was again, I'm sorry? The right. So that's very pertinent to this time of the year. Why? Because now we have the mitzvah of doing bikatailanot to bless the trees. There is, right, if you see, right, two fruit trees that are budding now. The flowers are coming out, just about to bud. So it's a mitzvah to go there, right, and to make a blessing on that. It's a special mitzvah. Now at this time of year, in the Chodesh Nisan, before Pesach. And also after Pesach you can do it, but better to do it now. Why wait till later, right? Unless they didn't blossom yet, they didn't, they didn't bloom yet. They didn't bloom, so wait until they bloom. But uh, they say, right, the Mekubalim, the Kabbalists, they say, what's the reason why we have to make this bracha on the, on the trees? So this is exactly what you're talking about. What's the story? According to the Kubalim, there are neshamot that come down as a gilgul, as a re- reincarnation, into the tree. They actually get reincarnated into the tree. You understand? Can you imagine such a thing like that? You know, one time you were, you were David, and now you're Mr. Tree, right? You know, <laughs> so, you know, it's an amazing thing, right? Uh, you know, a person can come back also as a goy, can come back also as a woman, can come back also as, as, a, um, as a cat or a dog, depending on what he needs. You understand? What his tikkun is. So, you can also come back as, as a plant. Can you imagine? As a plant, as a tree, you know, whatever. So, what, what they say is, right, that when you make this bracha, you're doing them a kindness of these souls, right? They get stuck in the tree. So, what happens is that now your bracha frees them up and they can go back to where they belong in the Gan Eden, right? So, this way they can uh, finish their tikkun in that tree, whatever that tikkun had to do in that tree, whatever it was. And you free them up by making your bracha. So, they say, by the way, that in, in turn, because you did this chesed for them, kindness of making this bracha, and freeing them out of the, of, the, of the tree. So what they do is they go up there, right? And they remember you, who you are, you know? Ah, this guy, he's the one who, who freed me out from the tree. So now he recommends for you good things. He says over there, you know, it says good things about you over there, you know? He's a good boy, treat him nicely, you know, don't punish him. Be, go easy on the guy, go easy, he's a good boy, you know? He helped me out, so you also go get help, help him out. So that's the reason why we make this bracha, you know? So that you can see from there, that a person come back and back as anything. Uh, just to make the tikkun that he has to come back, uh, that he has to do. So regarding your question, it's a very powerful question, uh, but the truth is, right, HaKadosh Baruch Hu needs the, the, the Gilgul to make the tikkun. So that's a, it has to be a part of the story, right? So if you would just you would bring the, all the neshamot, you're right, it will be very simple, you could do it in one generation, the whole thing. Right? But the problem is that it's our fault that we didn't do the tikkun, you know, we didn't finish the tikkun, so now we have to uh, come back more and more and more and more. The truth is, right, that um, that's what the coming of Mashiach depends on, depends on our tikkun. You know, if you didn't finish your tikkun, so how's Mashiach going to come? You're not done yet. So we have to wait for you too. Understand? We got to wait for everybody until they finish the tikkun. That's what the Rambam says, right? The Rambam says in uh, Hilchot Melachim, over there, when it talks about Mashiach, says the Rambam that before Mashiach comes, or, or during the coming of Mashiach, all the Jews will do tshuva in the end. Every one of them. Can you imagine? Every Jew is going to do tshuva. Even the hard ones, you know, the, one of the ones that are hard to crack. He says, by the way, that what? That if they don't, if they don't do tshuva until Mashiach comes, so what's going to happen is the same thing that happened in the desert. When Moshe Rabbeinu took them out to the desert, and they had to go out there and had all, all those squabbles and all those, uh, you know, issues that went on over there, the fights, the, you know, the, the screaming, the yelling, this and that, you know, like, you know, pinchas, all these things. You know, these, these kinds of things. So what, what's the story? The story is that... Uh, Kadosh Baruch is going to do that again, the same thing. He's going to take them out to the, to the desert again, like Moshe Rabbeinu. Why is that? Because these guys, the ones that die hard, who don't want to do tshuva, you know? They don't want to wake up. They're still sleeping. They're still, you know, uh, you know they're still in, in the slumber. So what's going to be? Like Kadosh Baruch is going to take them out there into the desert, and he's going to now make a judgment over there, like talk with them. No, what's with you? How long is it going to take you? I'm waiting for you. 6,000 years. How long is it going to take? That's what I said last week. You know? How long is it going to take you? 
So they're going to come and start with their excuses. You know what I mean? Again, you know, you know, uh, this hard and this is hard and keeping Shabbat is hard and this is difficult and I like women. I'm, I'm a womanizer. You know, I like to check out girls. This everyone's going to say this is crazy thing. Whatever it is, you understand? Each one has his own, uh, n- you know, the nutty stuff. And uh, the Haskalah Prophet is going to answer them. He's going to answer each one of them and say, listen, it doesn't really matter anymore. Just do tshuva. You know, it doesn't make any difference. You have to do tshuva, nevertheless. So it's going to be forced upon us. Kind of like forced, you know, in the sense that, in other words, it's going to be like either do or die. You know, like, in other words, they're going to say, you know, listen, either you do or you're gone. That's it. So, you're you're, you're so, out. So when the Torah says that all the Jews will do tshuva, it's not going to be on our own free will. Most, some of them will do tshuva on their own right. free will, them, and the ones who don't yeah. will have to go out and have this right. Uh, they're going to be subpoenaed into the desert. You know, subpoena. What's nice. the subpoena? Nice. They're going to get a subpoena over there, and there's going to be a very, 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 very uh, strong court case over there with Akdosh Baruch Hu and these people, right? Who are still diehards, who still are holding out. You know, holding out and saying, "No, it's, it's, uh, I can't do that. It's too hard for me." You know, this and all these things. So they're going to they're going to be squeezed. They're going to squeeze them over there. That's what's going to happen. So, can you imagine? It's going to be a very difficult thing, this whole thing. It's going to be very, very hard. But anyway, Rabbi Tai, getting back to what we're saying. So, it says over here that Yitzhak was 40 years old when he married Rivka. So, how does the mathematics go, right? The mathematics goes like this. When he was 37 years old, he, that's when they did the Akedah, right? The binding of Yitzhak was done when he was 37. So, at that time, as, as, as the Akedah was over, the binding was over, Akedosh Baruch Hu notified Abraham Mabinu. He said, you know what? Now the, the, the match for your, your, your son was just born. So he had to wait, even though she was born at 37, he had to wait till the age of 40. Why is that? Because as we already mentioned, right, that until the age of three, the woman is not, it's not proper for intercourse. So therefore he had to wait till the age of, age of three in order that he should be able to have intercourse with her. This is the reason why he had to wait. So once he, they, they waited until that age, so then it was time to get married. That's the way it was, right? So that's why he got married when he was at the age of 40. And Rivka at that time was uh, three, as we mentioned, right? So uh, as we're going to go on and say, that was. It mentions also the Pasuk, something interesting, right? It says, Rivka, he was Bat Betuel. She was the daughter of Betuel. And, uh, and he was the, she was a sister of, of Lavan. It mentions that again. This we already knew, right? We already knew Betuel was the father. Lavan was the brother. Again, we have to come and say this again and again. Now, what's, what's the point? So here also it's coming to teach something the Chazal say, right? That what? That Rivka was a very unique girl. Why? Because she was surrounded by Rasha'im from all the sides, you know? Father was a Rasha, brother is a Rasha, this one is a crook, this one is a gangster, you know? This one is a magician, this one is a sorcerer. Each one is a Rasha, each one is, is, is worse than the other. You understand? But she anyway turned out to be good, which is something very rare, right? That usually a person who's surrounded with wicked people, he also get influenced by that, you know? But Rivka was able to somehow deflect the influence of, of, uh, of these Rashaim that were, that were around her and still come out to be good. This was an amazing thing. So that's why it mentions that, right? That was the whole, uh, which is in itself, you know, something very amazing. By the way, just the opposite we're going to see with Esav, right? Who was the son of Rivka. Esav, the wicked, the wicked, wicked Esav. He was just the opposite. He turned out to be wicked even though his father was a tzaddik. His mother was a tzaddik. You understand? His, her, his brother was a tzaddik. Surrounded by tzaddikim, he turned out to be wicked anyway. You understand? So meaning what? That when a person is wicked, he's really, really wicked, so he can come out to be bad anyway, no matter how many, you know, he's surrounded by how many good people. It doesn't make any difference, right? And then a person who's that wicked, so that corrupted, so her, his son, her son, was just so the opposite not, of what she was. his fault in the way. Uh, just the opposite, right? It's more his fault because he was surrounded. You know, he, he had what to learn from. No, I mean, are there people that are a bad seed by birth? That's a good question. No, he's asking. God made him this way. Uh-huh. God made him this way. Yeah, amazing question. Yeah, yeah. amazing question, right? Uh, and th- th- by the way, this is uh, one of the questions which are asked by the philosophers. Also, you know, this question. Uh, you know the, the the theologists and so forth and so on. If a person, right? If a person is 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 has an evil inclination, so how can he turn out to be good, whatever, and all these things? He's a bad person by nature, you know, whatever. So that's why, right? We were notified already in the beginning of the of the Bible when it started out the whole thing. When Cain sinned, you know, and murdered his brother. So Kadosh what did he tell him over there after after the murder took place? He said, "Listen." What's it? What's it with you? You know, like why did you, why did you do this? Right. By the way, this was even before the murder, when his offering was not accepted on the, on the altar. He brought it up an offering. His brothers was accepted. Havel he, he, was accepted. His, his offering was not accepted. So it comes and now he's like he's got this you know bad face, you know dark face like this, you know, cringing. And Hakadosh Baruch looks at Kain and says, you know, what's with you? What? What are you? What are you like? What are you cringing about? So 
what, what's, what's, what's the situation? The situation is like this, right? That Kedosh Baruch Hu told to, to Cain, what? What are you trying to tell me? The Yetzirah is really bad? You're like, you have, a, you, have a, you have a nature of a murderer and that's why you killed your, killed your brother? All, all these things? But you know, you can rule over evil inclination. In other words, Kedosh Baruch Hu, I gave you evil inclination and I gave you a way to overcome the evil inclination. How do you do that? By learning Torah. Right? If you don't study Torah, right, as, it says, as the Chazal say, right, that Kedosh Baruch Hu made the disease, which was the evil inclination, the Yetzirah, and the only way to overcome that, you know, the elixir, the, the medicine for that is the Torah. Nothing else, nothing else works. So what People try, by the way, all kinds of other things. That Esau wasn't uh, uh, learning the Torah enough? Or? So, yeah, that's the whole thing. Esau, right, was, was uh, he had a bad nature, it's true. You know, his nature was really, really bad. But he could have overcome it if he wanted to. So that's the, that's the thing. So a person is blamed for that, for not overcoming the, the evil inclination. You know, you have, okay, so everybody else, right? They say, right, that whatever it is that you have, some kind of evil inclination, everybody has something, right? Whatever it is. Uh, so the Kaklash Baruch is going to tell you like this, when they come to judge you in the end, right? They're going to say, listen, you know, okay, what's the problem? Why didn't you do tshuva? So they're going to say, uh, one guy's going to say, well, you know, I was very good looking, you know, and, and the girls were going for me, you know, so I couldn't resist. You know? I was like a really handsome guy. So the girls were jumping on me, whatever, you know? So what can I do? So Kadesh Baruch was going to tell him, listen, you know, Yosef HaTzadik was better looking than you. you, if, you put, we, we, if we put you next to him, you're going to look like a monkey. So what, you're going to tell me that what? You're handsome as he was? But he resisted it. He, you know, he, he, he resisted it. You weren't able to do it, so you have no excuse to say that you're, because you were handsome, you were good looking, whatever. All these things have no, there's no excuse. Then the one, is going to, one guy's going to say, you know what, I was wealthy, and you know, because of that, you know, I was... The evil inclination was very strong because it was my wealth. You know, I could buy anything I want. You know, money, money buys everything. So you can buy anything you want when you have money. So I was, uh, I was misled by that. I was fooled by the money. You know, I was wealthy. What can you do? A wealthy person's test is not the same as a poor person, right? A wealthy person has a very big test because he can get anything he wants. You know, everything is available to him. Nothing is, uh, nothing is, uh, you know, off, off limits, right? So, Kadosh Baruch Hu tell him, listen, were you, were you as wealthy? Were you as wealthy as uh, Rabbi Lazar ben Azariah, right? Who was a wealthy man and he resisted the evil inclination. There were also wealthy people, also, who, right? Who resisted their, resisted their evil inclination. He was wealthy and he became a rabbi. He became a tzaddik. And you, you were wealthy and you became a bum. So you got to come and tell me now because you have your wealth. So meaning what? There is no excuse. You understand? Know, Kadosh Baruch Hu is going to prove to everybody you have no excuse. Whatever nature is that you had, that was a, that was your challenge. That was your, you know. Yeah. yeah. As wicked as he was, Asaf. You told us that he manipulates the world, as we know. Yeah, we're going to get to that. That's, uh, that's, a, right. that's a big discussion. No, something, right? I'm I'm I hope we'll have time to it. discuss it today. Well, maybe, maybe next time, right? Whatever it is. Right. Uh, there's so, a reason for it. Yeah, th there's a reason for it because it's it's all for the benefit of the world. You know, we need that. We need that also. That side. Obviously, we yeah, for sure. Without that, you can't do the job here. You know, it's uh, without without that uh, side. Okay, so we'll, we'll, we'll try to explain that. So uh, it says right that what. That now, a certain amount of time passed by. We already talked about this before, by the way, right? That what? That when, she, when he married her, she was three years old. So, a three-year-old cannot have children, you know? It's not, I mean, it's not, you, know you, can't, you can't pull off something like that. So, um, you have to wait till she's 13, basically, you know? Like a teenager, you know? 12, 13, whatever. So, what he did was he waited 10 years until she was able to have children. He still was with her all that time. So and then, then yeah, intimate. sure, sure. And once, once he waited that ten years, so now he started to you know want to have children, whatever you know. So okay, waited another ten years. Right now she was already twenty three years old, you understand? And he's already sixty, and no children. You know, nothing happens. Right, ten years, going, 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 going. Nothing happened. Nothing moves. So once that happened, this is um, this is a milestone kind of a thing. Whatever you know. Why? Because they say. It says in halakha that if a person marries a woman and for 10 years they don't have children, you know, so you should divorce her and marry somebody else. That's what it says in halakha. So therefore, it was either it was do or die with them now. Either he had to divorce her or he had to pray for her to make some kind of, to get things moving. So what, what they, they first they tried prayer, right? So what they do is they start to pray. Isaac Avino, right, stood on one side. You know, Rivka stood on the other side of the room and they're both praying, right? And... Uh, uh, but this was 20 years after they got married. That's what I'm trying to point out, right? He was already 60 years old at this time. And he was, she was 23. Still no children. So they're praying and praying and praying and praying and praying, praying, right? Because they want, they know, right? Either they, they pray it succeeds or they have to get divorced. That's, that's, the, that's, the, that's the situation. Uh, so it says, right, that... Did they take a time period? 
Like we pray for the next year, the next six months. Actually, you know, this thing was like a very short thing. It was just like, you know, either now or that's it. Because they're not really allowed to wait another year. You understand? Once you wait 10 years, that's it, it's over. You know, so either like you pray, something gets done, or no, that's it, it's over. You know, you gotta get, get, get go on. It's, uh, uh, yeah, that's the way it is. Um, by the way, nowadays Ashkenazim don't, don't do that. They don't divorce their wife after 10 years. For some reason, they took on the custom to ignore this thing. Uh, probably could be, there are several reasons for that, by the way. Practical reasons, you know, sometimes but really, the yeah. Is you must divorce her or you can divorce her? According, according to the Halakha and the Shulchan Aruch, according to the Talmud, you have to divorce her. And if you don't, you know what, they punish you also. The bad thing can punish you for that. Why? Why is that? Why can they punish you? Because you don't want to have children. You get, get it on your head. Pah, 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 pah. You're going to get beat you up. You understand? So you don't want to, right, exactly. So you don't want to do the mitzvah of having children. So they're going to they're gonna give it to you. They're going to give you on the head. Right? Give you some makot, some uh, uh, slams, right? Slams on your head. That's what they do. They slam you. So, uh, now it says, right, that once they prayed, so right away, when they said the prayer, Akadosh Baruch Hu listened to Yitzchak, it says, right? To him. It doesn't say listen to her, by the way. They both were praying. So then why did he listen to him and to her, not to her? She was also a tzaddik. He was also a tzaddik. Okay. So they say, by the way, that from here that you learn something interesting that the prayer of a person who's a tzaddik, who's a son of a tzaddik, is stronger than the prayer of the one who's a tzaddik, but his father was a rasha, you know, son of a rasha. So that's the reason why his prayer has had more power than hers. And this is the why, reason why he was listened to, and she, she wasn't really answered here, right? He was answered. Interesting. Uh, by the way, you should know that according to the Kabbalah, when we say, right, that a person is a tzaddik, and his father was a tzaddik, Right. Sadiq ben Sadiq, Rasha ben Rasha, right? All these things, right? All these var- variations. According to the Kabbalah, we don't mean his real father, his paternal, you know, his, his, his physical father, you know, not Osiko, you know, not Samsoni. We're not talking about that. We're talking about your last Lugul, your last reincarnation. That's called your father. The last time you were in this world, he was your father, you know? The last time that you were here, so that's called your father, according to the Kabbalah. So, meaning what? That if a person, he's a person who comes to this world, and in the last Gilgul, he was a tzaddik, he's treated differently than a person that was in his last Gilgul, he was a rasha. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the one who was a tzaddik in the last Gilgul gets more benefits in this world. He makes, has an easier life, more, better parnasah, more, gets more wealthy, gets more, gets better life, you know, easier life, whatever. Why? Because of the person who was in his last Gilgul, uh, a rasha, he needs now to be punished for that and to get rectification for that. Tikkun. He needs, he needs atonement, right, for that. So the atonement comes by coming into this world and having all kinds of suffering. You know, come, come on. You know, this is the way to atone for the, for the last Gilgul. And a person has to believe in that, by the way, because if, otherwise if you don't, you know, you could really like go crazy because, you know, you may think, my God, you know, I've got all the tough breaks in my life, all, all you know, things. I've had the worst life in my, you know, like possibly. How did, why did it happen to me? I'm not such a bad guy, you know, after all, you know, I'm, like, I'm just like everybody else, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a gangster, you know, I'm not a mafia. You know, I'm not, I'm not John Gotti, I'm not a gangster. What, what, why is it coming to happen to me, these kinds of things? So a person has to understand, right, that it's because of the, the last Gugu. That's what it says according to the Kabbalah, according to Zohar, right? That's, that's the way it is. Okay. So let's go on over time. Interesting. Yeah. So it says over here, right, that what? That Rivka now, right, so it says, now what happened was that she, she went, and she, when she got pregnant, once the, the children became formed in her body, right, they were twins over there. So she had a very, very difficult pregnancy, you know, like unbearable. Now, you know, every pregnancy is difficult, you know what I mean? Uh, but this was like an unbearable pregnancy. Why is that, by the way? Why was it so uh, unbearable? Okay, twins are twins. Every, not, you know, twins come all the time, right? Every, every other day you have a twin coming. What's the big deal? So the thing was, Rabbi Tai, it says, right, the reason was because these two sons inside her stomach were always fighting, you understand? They were, they were having rumbling, you know? Can you imagine? Wrestling each other, you know, like this, you know? You know, get some down on the count, you know, headlock, this, ah, blah, no. Can you imagine? This was going on the day and night like that. So the question is why? <laughs> why are these two twins, you know, fighting with each other all the time? So the reason was is because of what I, these two were like totally like, you know, the opposites in this world, you know? One was from the side of good, one was from the side of evil, you understand? So they were fighting because they, they had the opposite nature. 
And so this one was saying, you know, listen, you know, this world belongs to me. And the other one was saying, no, not it doesn't. Everything belongs to you. So they were fighting about also the inheritance of this world, the next world. Who's going to get this world? Who's going to get the next world? They were also fighting about uh, other things as well. You know, what conditions are going to be, how, this, how things are going to turn out. So for so on. And they say also another thing, right? That what? That each one had a nature, right? The nature of Yaakov was that every time, uh, you know, you pass by like a Bet Midrash, you know, uh, a synagogue, whatever. So he had a, you know, a lust for that, you know, to, to, to get close to the holiness of the Torah. So he wanted to come out of the, you know, stomach, you know. He was like pulling, you know, pushing. Let me out of here. Can you imagine? So that was hurting her. And then her stomach was like the pressure of the stomach. And every time she would, she would pass by a church, you know, like, uh, you know, whatever. So Esau wants to come out, you know, because he likes to do Abu Zarah. He likes to do idolatry, you understand? So every time they pass by a church, he's like, get me out of here! I want to go into the church, you know? I want to bow down to the, uh, to the idol. That sounds like the omen. You remember the movie? With the son of the devil? So, <laughs> by the way, a lot of these things, they take from the, the Bible, these, yeah, a, lot, a lot of these narratives, you know? They come from the Bible. That's why, you, you know, there's a lot of uh, correlation there. Uh, you'd be surprised, by the way, how much they steal from there, from the yeah, Bible. These, these, uh, these narratives, a lot. Yeah. They steal a lot from there. Okay, whatever. So anyway, uh, they were fighting all the time. And she was like, oh, you know, like, it was all like, it was breaking her body. She couldn't take it anymore. Like totally mutilating her. She was getting mutilated. So what happens is that she finally decides, first of all, you know, she like, she had like a very bad thought in her mind when this happened. She said, you know, she started to regret that she got pregnant. You know what I mean? You know, she said, man, you know, like, if this is what it means to be pregnant, you know, I wish I wasn't pregnant at all, you know. It, it shouldn't have happened to me. And they say, by the way, the Chazal, that because she said these rough things, you know, in her, you know, in her mind, whatever, so she got punished for that. Yeah, but how, yeah. how could you blame her for having those thoughts? I mean, what? You know what it is that they say, this is a hard thing, you know, to, to swallow, you know, it's a hard, uh, but they say that when a person is suffering, he has to be able to, you know, be a man and Strong. take it, you know, right. He shouldn't complain when he's suffering, you know. Don't say, oh, no, oh I wish I would have never came to the world, you know, all these things, you know, people say, you know, they curse it themselves, you know, like, I should have never come to the world, I should have this, that, you know, you know, you know how this is, right, that people can start to curse themselves. And this is what we see, by the way, with Eov. Eov, once he started to have suffering, if you learn the book of Eov, he started to do all kinds of things like that, you know, the word, the, 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 all kinds of bad things say coming out of his mouth because he couldn't take the pain. It was too acute, the pain, you know, it was too, too much. So he, couldn't, he, start, he started to complain, he started to curse, all kinds of things. So they say, right, that she got punished. So what was the punishment that she got? Because Rivka really was supposed to be the mother of the 12 tribes. But that was the original plan. But now that she complained about having a pregnancy, so, you know, they gave her only two children, that's it, she never got more. She never, she never had more. She was supposed to have 12? Exactly. She was supposed to have all the tribes. She was supposed to be the mother of the 12 tribes. But because she complained, Sakadosh Baruch Hu said, you know what? <laughs> Maybe we're going too heavy on you. You know, we've got to go lighter on you. You're not so strong to, to hold 12 tribes. So they gave up on her. You know, they gave up. So she was only Zohet to have two, two children. And after yeah, that, she never had children. Yeah. Two, uh, uh, you know, embryos wrestling each other. And they're in... <laughs> yeah, it's World you know, Federation. World that, Federation I mean, wrestling. I mean, yeah, it's an amazing, it's an amazing test, you know. But you see, the thing is that uh, the Jew, you know, uh, is 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 uh, is expected to pass these tests. You understand? That's the that's the that's the strength that's the strength of the Jew. The, the amazing thing about the Jew is that he's supposed to pass. You know, don't say, oh, you know, I was weak, I was this and that. No, you have to pass. You have to go, you go and uh, fight. You know, you have to be a fighter. When you're a Jew, you got to fight. That's why we call the chosen people, right? Not for anything we're called the chosen people, just because we're in chosen garden, right? That's not why we call the chosen people. Chosen people because we have to we have to behave like that. We have to be unique. We have to be above everybody else, you know, different plateau. Different uh, that's that's the way it is. The people of the book, as they say, right? Okay. So uh so what happened was that she now wanted to get some uh, prophecy on, on this, you know, like to see why this is happening in her stomach, all this rumbling and this and that. So she goes to the Bet HaMidrash, you know, which was Yeshiva at that time. Right? Not Chafetz Chaim, right? We're talking about, uh, there was Yeshiva of Shem and Ever, the two big rabbis from that generation. These were the, the, Shem was the son of Noach, right? And Ever was the grandson of, of Shem. So what happened was that he goes over there, she goes to the yeshiva, and they're, they're over there, they're prophecy over there. So they, they check her out, you know, and they see what's going on. So they got the prophecy in their head. What are the prophecy they got? So listen, the reason why your stomach is so, is so hard like that is because 
you have two diametrically of those people in your, in your stomach who are fighting with each other all the time. And this is like going to continue all throughout history until the end of times. This is like, you know, the, the ultimate battle, the ultimate, uh, you know, uh, uh, fight that, that occurs over here, never is going to stop. So it, it, they told her, right, what the nature is going to be. The nature of this whole thing is going to be like this, right? That she is going to have two children. One is going to be, right, the forefather of the Jewish people, right, Yaakov Avinu. And the other one, Esav, is going to be the forefather of the, of the, uh, of the Edom, right? Edom, who is Edom? So we have to explain, right, what, uh, what, what, what is Edom? Just a brief thing, you know, because I wrote about this in my book, actually. I have a book that I wrote about this, about other things as well. But over there, when I, I described at length about all these things, the proofs that I brought, the, the, whatever. But the, what the Chazal say, right, that Edom, this nation of Edom, who was Esav, the descendants of Esav, first of all, you have to understand one thing. Esav and Yaakov were twin brothers. They looked like just like each other. Understand? They're twins. You know? So we're talking about a nation which looks just like us. They look just like we do. There's no difference. You understand? So that's one thing you have to understand. Number two is also Edom, Esav, right? He was living, the country was, Edom was in the south of Eretz Israel. Where today like Elat is, that area, you know, the, uh, the Negev, the Elat, over there where the people go to vacation, you know, to swim over there. So Elat is where, that's where uh, Edom was. That was the country of Edom. So what happened was that uh, they were there for several hundred years and then they went into exile because came th these two big kings, right, who took everybody to exile which was Sanhariv, right, the, the king of Ashur, and uh, Nebuchadnezzar who was the king of Babel, of Iraq. So these two kings, right, were very powerful, very mighty, and they changed around, you know, shifted the nations around from place to place. This guy goes over here, this guy's going to go over here, right? Everybody got exiled. So what happened was that the Edomim, the, the descendants of Esau, also got exiled. They also went to exile. So where did they go, right? So it seems like what happened was, according to the description of the Chazal, the, the, the commentators, that they wound up in, in Rome, in Italy. Right? That's, what, that's what happened. How, how did that happen? That there was the grandson of uh, Esav, his name was Tsefo. Right? Tsefo was a grandson of Esav. And Tsefo, the story goes like this, right? It's, a whole, it's an very interesting narrative. What happened was that when, when Yaakov Avinu died, so, you know, he was supposed to be buried in Marta Machpelah, in the, in the special cave over there, right? So what happened was that he told Yosef, listen, I want you to swear to me. You're going you're gonna to take me over there, right? To bear, don't bury me anywhere else. Only over there. So Yosef HaTzadik said, tells him, no problem, you know, you, you got my word, you know. No, no questions, no questions asked. What happened was that Yosef HaTzadik, once really his father died, Yaakov, so he now had to do a couple of things to get this thing done. Number one, he had to get permission from Paro. You understand? Because Paro was, after all, he was above, he was above Yosef, you know? Even though Yosef was practically the king of the country, but Paro, you know, in, in position, was one step above. You understand? So even though he was just sitting around doing nothing, Paro, you know? Yosef was doing all the work. He was just sitting around having a good time, you know? Watching CNN or whatever. And then Yosef was really doing the, running the country. But anyway, in, in, in the plateau of the king, he was above. So what happened was he had to go to Paro and ask him. He asked Paro. He says, listen, do me a favor. You know, my father asked me, you know, made me swear to, you know, to bury him in Marat al So let me go and, you know, do this because I have to, you know, have to do this, the oath. I have to fulfill the oath. So Paul tells him, he says, listen, he says, don't, he says, I know you, you're Jews. He says, uh, he tells, the Paul tells him, he says, you have this thing, you know, with your, with your rabbis that you can annul the oath, like, you know, if you regret it. So he says, why don't you go, you know, and go to the rabbis, you rabbi rabbis, you know, and go to Jewish court, and not the oath, you know, so what's the big deal? So you can bury him over here, you know, we have plenty of pots over here, you know, no, no problem. So Paul tells him like that, you know. So Yosef HaTzadik tells him, he says, he says, you know, he says, you're right, but he says, you know what? He says, if, if that's the case, Yosef HaTzadik tells him like this, he, he like threatened him, you know, Yosef over here. What do you say? He says, you know, he says, you also made me take an oath one time. Remember when I first came to be, right, the king over here, when you made me the king over here, he told him, you know what? There was an episode where Yosef HaTzadik, when he was freed from jail, he had to go to stand in front of Paro, right? Paro called him up. And so what happened was that Paro had a throne, you know, that he had to go up the stairs to, like, to get to him, whatever. So Yosef was standing on the bottom of the throne, you know what I mean? And Paro was all the way on top. So... Uh, there was, like they say, the Chazal, there were 70 steps. You had to go up to get to the top of the, of the plateau, the throne. So how did you go up? You, you couldn't go up for free. You had to do something to prove to yourself. So what was that? They say, right, that Paro himself was like a genius. So he spoke 70 languages, you know, all the languages of the world. You know, all the languages. So what happened was that in order to go up to the throne of Paro, to get the, 
every step you go up, you have to speak one more language. You have to prove that you speak English, French, right, Dutch, you know, this, Portuguese, this, everything, you know, Spanish. You know, uh, if, you, if you prove one, you got to go up one step, right? That's the way it was, you understand? So Yosef at Sadiq now, right, now is sitting on the bottom, standing on the, on the, top, the bottom of the, of, the, of, the, of the steps. So Paro is saying, okay, no, let's see, you know, can you speak languages? You want to get up to me? Let's see if you, if you, if you're good. Let's say, by the way, Yosef at Sadiq had no idea how to speak any languages. He never learned any of the, he only knew Hebrew. That's the only thing he knew. From his father, you understand? So what happened was that uh, the Malach Gavriel, right? Gavriel was an angel. One of the angels came that night before he came to Paro and he taught him all the languages, you know, when he was sleeping. He, he put it into his head, you know, gave him an injection. You know, so he put everything inside of him. When, when he comes to uh, Paro, so Paro asks him, okay, no, let's hear your English. Let's see. You know? How's your English? Blah, 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 blah. Okay, good. How's your French? Blah, blah. One more step. How's your Spanish? How's your Portuguese? How's your Greek? Good. Blah, blah, goes up, 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 up. Okay, you speak Arabic? Yes. Okay, good. So then, right, he got up there, and, uh, even, you know, 70 languages he gave him, just like he wanted, right? So he tells Paro, when he gets up there, he says, I speak also one more language, he says. So he says, what? What, what, what language? He says, I gave you all the languages. There is no other languages. Paro tells him. So he says, no, there's one more language. Like Lashon HaKodesh, Hebrew, right? Hebrew, there's one more. So I speak also Hebrew. I'll tell you also Hebrew. So Paro said, Hebrew? He says, I don't know this language. What are you talking about? What, what language is that? So they say, by the way, that in those times, Hebrew was known to some people. You know? The, so the question is, why didn't Paro know Hebrew? You know, there were, there were people who knew Hebrew. So why Paro didn't know? If he was such a big genius, right? Why didn't he know? So they say the reason is because he was so tame, he was so impure, you know, in his neshama. He was such an impure person, that he was such a filthy person, that he couldn't learn such a holy language, you know? He didn't have the capacity to, that it should go inside of him. So therefore, he wasn't able to learn Hebrew. So, so Paro tells Yosef, he says, you know what, listen, listen, listen do me a favor. He says, I, you know, I know that you know Hebrew and I don't know. So he says, don't embarrass me now, you know? Don't tell people over here that you know Hebrew and I don't know. It's going to make me, make me embarrassed. So Paro tells him, he says, you know what, I want you to swear to me now. You know, you're not going to tell anybody about that, ever. Because if you do, you're going to be in big trouble. So Yosef HaSadik says, I swear to you, okay, I won't, I won't tell anybody. So now Yosef HaSadik comes and tells him, he says, don't you remember when you made me make that oath about you also? He says, I'll also go to the rabbis and I'll also know that oath. You know? He says, I'll tell people that you don't speak Hebrew. So once Paro heard that, he says, oh, wait, no, wait, wait, forget about that. He says, you know what, go, go bury your father, he tells him, you know. You threatened him like that, you know, gave him like a veiled threat. So once he tells him, go bury your father, it's okay, it's okay. It's okay. So once Yosef at Sadiq, right, had got permission to bury his father, so what happened was that now he also had a different problem. What was the problem? The problem was that he knew once he gets there to bury him, there's going to be there's going to be a battle. What's going to be the battle? The sons of Esav are going to come over there, right? And they're going to say, you know what? Our for, our forefather Esav, our father, is the firstborn. He deserves to be buried over here, not Yaakov. Yaakov is not the firstborn. So they're going to come and they, you know they're going to object. They're going to have, it's going to, it's going to be a battle ensuing over there. So Yosef HaTzadik knew that. He knew what's going to be, right? He was, he wasn't dumb. So he took, you know, with him soldiers from Egypt, you know, he was a king. So he was able to take an army also with him. So he took an army, you know, soldiers, you know, big guys, tough guys, goons, you know. So he takes a lot of goons over there with him, big army, and he goes, starts to go to Mitzrayim, to, to, to Eretz Israel, right? So he goes over there, and all of a sudden, you know, just, he was, just like he was expecting, who, lo and behold, who shows up, right? Tzifo, the son, the grandson of Esav, shows up there with his own army, you know, with his own people, some goons over there with him. And he says to Yosef al you're not going to bury your father here, this is our father's blood. Don't, don't think you're going to do that. No way. So Yosef al tells him, he says, listen, he says, but you know, you're, you're right, your father was the firstborn. But our father bought the, the, the firstborn right from him, as we're going to see, right? In the, in, the, in the narrative over here. So this is what Yosef tells him. He says, we bought that. So Tsefo stands in front of Yosef. He tells him, he says, you claim that your father bought the first right uh, from, from my father? He says, where's your document? You have, you have a star? You have a, you have a contract? So he tells him, he says, yeah, but you know, it's all the way back in, in Mitzrayim. We have to um, go back in there, right? So he sent his brother back, Naftali, who was a fast runner, goes and gets it back, right? brings back the contract, shows it to him. He says, yeah, here it is. So Tsefo says, you know what? He says, with all due respect, I don't know, I think this contract is forged, you know? Some kind of, you know, some kind of a, this is not, this is not kosher, this contract. I don't believe in it. I think this was all, you know, some kind of a forgery. So ensues a battle over there, you understand? They couldn't, they couldn't come to agreement. 
So battle starts, you know, start the fighting, pa 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 pa. So the, the Yosef HaTzadik with his army was able to overcome Tsefo with his army. You understand? So what happened was Yosef HaTzadik put Tsefo in, 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 in shackles, in chains, you know. And he took him back to Mitzrayim. He put him in jail. That's what he did. He jailed him, you know. So uh, he puts him in jail. And Tsefo, the grandson of Esav, was in jail all that time until Yosef HaTzadik died. When Yosef HaTzadik died, so then... Tsefo escaped from prison somehow, you know? He got, he got out. He tunneled out of there. Dug out, you know? So he dug out. So what they say, right, the Chazal, is that once Tsefo escaped from Mitzrayim, where he was jailed over there, he went to Rome. That's where he went, right? He went, he ran, ran over there. And he was the first king of, of the Roman people there. The, he, he went over there. He made like, uh, agreements with the people, local population. And he became the king, you know? He was an uh, impressive guy, this guy, you know? All the people from Abraham Avinu's family, they were all impressive people, very, very smart, very good looking, and this and that. So he made, you know, charmed, right? he charmed them, you know, like they couldn't resist him. So he, they made him the king. So it says in Amman, right, that he was the first king of Rome. The first king of Rome was Tsefo. And, and from, from there on, all the kings of Rome were from Esav. They were from the, the right, and then, then came also the, the other people from Esav, all the other brothers, right, the, 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 the children, the grandchildren, and all this, they all assembled over there, and they made one big, right, uh, country over there. So the Roman Empire, right, as, as we knew it, right, from that time, was founded by Esav and his descendants. Which part yeah. So the story is like this, right? They died on the same day. Because, yeah, why? Why is that? Because uh, they say, right, that when Rivka went and she got this prophecy, as we spoke about, so they say that not only they told her what I told you, but they also told her, they said, you know what? They're going to die also on the same day. Just like they were born on the same day, they're twins, they're also going to die on the same day. So she knew that, right? That they were supposed to die on the same day. So she was very careful about that. That they, you know, that one of them shouldn't die because then the other one will also, also die. So because of that, what happened was that once Yaakov Avinu was brought there to Marat and to be buried, Yesaf Esav also died that day. Right? How was that? How did he die? Because they say, right, that uh, uh, when Esav and his sons came to contest the burial over there, so what happened was that Hushim Ben Dan, right, one of the grandsons of Yaakov Avinu, came over there, right, and gave, took like a club, you know, some kind of club, and gave a big bop to Esav over his head, like this, bah, you know, and he killed him, he t- knocked off his head, right? He cut off his head, chopped off his head, uh, yeah. What age, what age was that? What age was he? What, uh, what uh, Esav? They were both at that time, Yaakov and, and, and Esav, the same age, right, 137. Oh, they lived that long? Yeah, 137, wow. yeah. So, uh, they were twins, right? So, uh, what happened was that he killed them over there. And they say, by the way, that also Esav, even though he wasn't buried in Marat Machpelah, because it wasn't really his place, he, he already sold it to Yaakov. Mm-hmm. But he, his head was buried there, because he, he chopped off his head. So what they did was that they, they, the head was, was buried there. And they took the body back, right, to wherever they went, and they buried... So the, the head of Esav was also buried over there in Marat Machpelah. Interesting, right? Mm-hmm. The question is, why, why the head of Esav? Why, what's the reason why? Because they say, right, that Esav had some good thoughts in his head. You know, he had some thoughts of doing tshuva. So because of that, he never, even though he never, he never like actually did tshuva physically, you know, was corrupted because he was a sinner. You know, he was always like reaching for sins. You know, this sin, this sin, that sin, you know. His body was totally corrupted with sins. But his head was thinking about doing tshuva all the time. So they say that's the reason why he was zoche to be buried over there in Mat because his head had some kedusha, had some holiness in there. Think about doing tshuva, you know? That's the whole thing. So they, they, each, right, each part of the body got buried in a different so place. So he yes. is considered, Esav is considered the anti, the, you know, anti-God Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, yeah, that's what is. it is. Yeah. So the Roman Empire, what happened was like this. Yes, exactly, David. Yeah. So they say the Roman Empire, by the way, what happened was like this, right? That in the, in the, in the beginning, the Roman Empire was totally pagan, you know, the pagan religion. Pagan means like very, you know, like very, uh, very uh, uh, primitive, you know, like very, you know, like cruel and, you know, cruel and nasty and very primitive. Not, no logic, no, 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 no wisdom. It's just very, very foolish stuff going on there. You understand? Pagan, very old-fashioned, you know, very, 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 very nasty, whatever. So they say that uh, what happened was that there was one emperor over there whose name was Constantine, right? Of, of the Roman Empire, Constantine. So Constantine was like way, way after the destruction of the Second Temple. The Second Temple was destroyed by the Romans, you understand? It was Titus. Yeah. Titus was the one who destroyed yeah. the Second Temple. So what happened was that through about 300 years after that, the Roman Empire was still alive, was still going, was still kicking. 
So there was one emperor over there called uh, Caesar, right? His, his name was Constantine. So what happened was that Constantine had a problem. The problem with Constantine was that he saw that a lot of the people in his empire were converting to Judaism, you know? So it was like becoming like a big fad, you know? Like this one is eating kosher, this one is eating empire, this one is putting trillion on his head, you know? All kinds He's of things the one like this. who, uh, uh, who uh, took on Christianity. Exactly, that's what He's I wanted to say, one, right? Yeah. So what happened was that Constantine had this problem that there were a lot of people converting to Judaism, you understand? It was becoming like a big fad. So uh, what happened was that he was looking for a solution for this. He wanted to find a solution. So they say, right, that the best solution that he could find was like this, right? That came to him these Jews, you know, who were the the the, the Talmudim of Yeshu, you know? They were Talmud of Yeshu, you know? So they, uh, they, they came to Constantine and they said, you know, listen, he said, we're Talmudim of this guy, you know? We have something good to offer you, you know? You want to get rid of Judaism over here? We have a religion which is going to fight against that, you know? Be a block, block it out, right? So Constantine said, no, let me hear what you have to say, you know, this and that. So Constantine liked this idea. They sold it to him, you understand? They sold it. So because of that, what happened was that Constantine now officially took on the Christian religion in his empire to be the official religion of the Roman Empire. That's what happened. That's how the Vatican started and all this. Isn't it true that even, the, uh, even the Rambam said, or uh, not, yeah. not even, but he, he's the one that it's, it's, you know, published that he said, that uh, whether we like it or not, uh, we like it. We like it. That uh, uh, Jesus had to come. Sure it was right. Yeah. It's not exactly what it says, by the way. But the Bambam says it like this, right? That even though these religions, you know, it, it's Christianity be, and, and Muslim, they're both false and they're both foolish and they're both nonsense. They serve but, a purpose. They, right. Exactly. It serves a purpose. Yeah. What's the purpose? That as we said, right? That before these religions came in, the, the, the Goetia world was totally pagan which was like the most cruel, unusual, you know, they strangest needed, thing. They needed guidance. Exactly. They needed something to, 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 to make them, pacify them a little, to calm them yes. down. You know? Yes. So what, what happened was that these religions served as, as, a, as a vehicle to make, you know, to bring some kind of a law and order into the world, you understand? To make them more humane. Yeah. Because there is some humanity, you know, in these religions. But at the same yeah. time, we were cast out, in a way. Well, you know, the rest of yeah, the which is very good, by the I way. I mean, look yeah, at us. Yeah. There's what? Two point something billion... Christians, yeah, almost two billion Muslims, right. And what are we, right? But by the way, this is also for the best, you know, because we're cast out. Why? Because we, Akadosh Baruch wants us to be alone. He doesn't oh, want us mix. to mix into the game. You know what I mean? So well, there should be always some kind of hostility between us. We shouldn't be too friendly with nice. each other, because then we're going to start intermarrying. You know, she's going to he's going to marry Katharina, and she's going to marry right, he's going to marry Natalie and the yeah. Katharina, and this and you know all these things. You know why? Because you're too friendly. That's what happens, right? And this is, by the way, the problem with America. The problem with America is that they're much, they're very nice to us, the Americans. You know, they love the Jews. They they treat us with a lot of respect. Bon you know, uh -huh. they treat us with a lot of respect. But the problem is that we get, we have so much, you know, respect and love that there's too much interaction. You know, this is the this Go is the problem on the that causes. Go and see how they respect. You, you understand? Yeah. So yeah, that's something else. There's always anti-Semitic. You know, there's always yeah. that, that that part of it. But the truth is, right, that uh, the American, you know, country as a nation, was born on like, you know, pretty much Jewish values in a sense, you know what I mean? The, you know, the, the Puritans and, the, you know, the, the Ten Commandments was a main central theme of, of this country. You know, so the truth is that the, the American, uh, the American uh, country is a very unique country. It's not like Europe, you know, Europe was like totally anti-Semitic, was totally like, you know, they slaughtered Jews left and right, you know, they had no, they had no respect, no, they had no, nothing. Europe was like a total, every, every square foot of, of Europe is full of Jewish blood, you understand? That's the way it is. One whole cost after the other, one program after the other. That's the way it is. But in America, it's not like that. They reject Rabbi, that. I find that's a, that. It's a I different thing, that, you know? Uh, it's a different kind of a thing. It's a, you have to I, give them respect for that because they deserve it. I mean, you know. If you they, say you know, so. Yeah, they deserve it. There's no question about that. I'm not saying Delhi was perfect. You know? No, no. Don't no. get me wrong. But, you know. I'll give them respect out of your respect. <laughs> uh, I find that the Torah yeah. is one big contradiction in, in many respects. Yeah. You understand all all this stuff about uh, you know the false re religions. Right. Uh, even though they're false, they still have to be there. Right. Uh, you know, there, there's a lot of yeah. It's it's hard to swallow all this. Yeah, stuff. it's it's it's, not, it's not easy. I agree with you. Listen, yeah. you know, you have to you have to go into this a little bit in depth, though. You know, to understand yeah. all this stuff. Because it's quite deep, you know, all this, all these issues. We're going to try to cover it, by and the way. When here. you go into yeah. depth, you may not be ready for it, so you you may get, you know, you may freak out. 
Yeah, yeah, well, you know, there's always a... <laughs> but, you know, we're not going to go that deep, and we're not going to yeah. freak you out. But what we have to do at least, you know, is to explain what the role is of each side here, you know, like mm-hmm. what the, you know, we have to understand all these things. Okay, so let's go on, Abatai. Uh, very, very powerful stuff you guys are talking about. Very, very, very deep stuff. Okay. So, uh, it says over here another thing, right? That there's another thing in the prophecy over here, which is, that says, uh, the prophets tell Rivka Imenu, our, for, our mother, Rivka, tell her that, you know, it's not only going to be two people who, that, you know, they're going to be like totally opposite. Totally opposite. But not only that, but we also have here two different nations, as we said, right? And one will always be poor, more powerful than the other. You understand? And it says also another thing, we're going to talk about that later, but we have to understand this concept, right? What does that mean, one will be always powerful than the other? It doesn't say which one, by the way, right? So that means that it can fit in either way. One time it's going to be this guy, one time it's going to be the other guy. It goes up and down. It fluctuates. What's the reason why? What's the reason why? Because they say, right, that since they are diametrically opposed, these two, they're the opposites. So when one gets strong, right, automatically the other one becomes weak. When this one goes up, this one goes down. When this one goes up, this one goes down. Right? Exactly, it's a scale, right? It's a scale. Exactly, yeah, it's seesaw, right, exactly. So why is that, by the way? Because the truth is that it's really, even though this happens, this up and down thing, right? you're never going to find both of them being very, very strong, you know, or very, very weak. One is going to be always stronger than the other. Why is that, by the way? Uh, so the reason is because since, uh, it, it really depends on the Jews, though, I must tell you. What does that mean? It doesn't depend on them. They don't have no choice. The other side. You understand? It all depends on us. We have the power to make this go, go up and down. Not them. Mm. They get, take it by default. You know what I mean? So if you don't want to take it, they get it. It's like, you know, you gave it to them. You gave it to them on a silver platter. So what does that mean? That if the Jews are keeping the Torah and Mitzvot, so they're up and the other one side is down. You understand? When they're not, so then they're up and the other side is down. That's the way it is. Yeah, you understand? Yeah. At that time, who was the biggest tzaddik? Who was the, at Rivka's time, who was the biggest? Well, you know, as we said, we had Yitzhak, we had, uh, we had Abraham, who was still alive at this time, okay, and we had uh, Shem and Ever, right? Fine, yeah, yeah, fine. Yeah. So why did she go to Shem and Ever when she had the husband right there? Who is the biggest, biggest tzaddik? It's a very, very, good, very, very good question. What's going on there? Very, very good question. I'll tell you something. Uh, I don't have a definite answer for you, but I can, you know, conjecture a little bit. What, what am I saying? That logically speaking, probably, you know, it makes sense to say that he didn't have the goods over here, you know, in a sense, it's like he didn't have, he didn't have the, the information. He didn't have it. Otherwise, she wouldn't have to go to somebody else, you understand? That's, you know, it's pretty, but also it could be that it's, that's something else, you know? It could be that, uh, she didn't she want did, to let him know? Exactly. She didn't want to bother him with this, you know, to trouble him with this, all this thing. Because if he was going to get this prophecy, he was going to show him that one of the sons is going to turn out to be really bad. And he, they, didn't want, they didn't want him to know in advance about this. Mm. You understand? Yeah. And by the way, this charade, what you just asked about, went on for, 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 for always. Until Yitzhak, Yitzhak died, he didn't know that Esav was a Rasha. Mm-hmm. You know, Esav was tricking him, you understand? Making him look, himself look like a good guy. So because of that, and by the way, it's, Rivka did know, and Yaakov did know, but they never told Yitzhak. Can you imagine? All this time, many, many, many years, one decade after the other, they never told him anything. Until the day he died. How long did he live? 180 years old. So meaning what, we're talking about 120 years, they didn't say one word to him. Can you imagine? Such a thing like that? And what's the reason why? Because they didn't want to say Lashon Hara about Esau for some reason. They didn't want to say. They didn't want to make. Uh, they didn't want to give Yitzhak the wrong impression like that about Esau. I don't know why. You have to. Okay. You know, it's, it's yeah. But it's you know because of this, she had to go to independent contractor over here. You understand? Different party, third party to get this information because for some reason or other, Yitzhak was not supposed to find out about all these things. He was not supposed to find out. So what does that mean? That he had to he had to make his own decision about this, right? They didn't want him to know as like a pre pre knowledge, you know. They didn't want to have uh, uh, forward knowledge about this. They wanted him to realize that with his own understanding, to come to that realization: who was who and what was what. That was his, you know. That was his tikkun, whatever, you know, to make this realization. So because of that, they didn't go. Very interesting question. But anyway, he, she went to to Shem and Eder, and this is probably the reason why, you know. Uh, we just said it's very interesting sense. yeah it makes sense yeah it does make sense so uh, anyway but it says also another thing which is that what as we said right one is going up and one is going down it's always a seesaw 
up and down, up and down, up and down. Never going to be anything else. Uh, and by the way, we see that in history. You see, right, sometimes the Jews were up, you know, and the and the Esav was down. Where are we right? now, according to the Torah? Or it's, good question. it's not uh, keeping track. Very, very good question. It's a very good question what you're asking. Well, Where are we I'm now? just wondering. Where are we now? What do you guys say? Where are we now? I don't know. What do you see? Politically speaking or geographically speaking? Yeah. Jews are ascending. There's no question about that. Mm. They're going up. There's mm. no question about that because they're doing tshuva. You know, we see a lot of people doing tshuva. In Israel, we saw hundreds of thousands of people do tshuva mm. over there. In the last 20 years, we're talking about a radical, you know, change. Really? Yeah, radical. Well, I did radical. About that. It's not the Israel that you left when you left there. It's not. It's not uh-huh. Uh-huh. You know, today you're going to find even kosher restaurants in Tel Aviv. You know, in, in the old days you couldn't find a kosher restaurant in Tel Aviv. Really? Yeah, it was hard to find. It was like a, like Paris. Even Paris had more than Tel Aviv. Now you're going to find Tel Aviv some some Jewish life, you know, synagogues, kollels, yeshivot. You're going to find things like that. You're going to find a kosher restaurant you can go to, you know, take, take, well, what a, take do a date think, over there. What do you, you know? think happened? Huh? What do you think People are doing chula. They're doing chula. That's it, you know, because of the the, the, the harshness of the reality that's around us. Uh-huh. You know, the terrorism and all these, you know, shocking things that are going on. Mm-hmm. Very shocking stuff going on, you know? Really? People getting shocked into reality, you know? Like, yes. uh, we thought, you know, life was for fun, but, you know, it doesn't seem that well, way. I, I didn't know <laughs> I had no idea. Yeah, it's, it's a very big movement over there. And it's changing the whole face of... The, and by the way, this is why, if you want to know, what do you see around Israel? All the countries that are around are all destroyed. Iraq is destroyed. Syria is destroyed, right? Uh, what, what's the other country? Lebanon. Yeah, Lebanon. Dest- yeah. They're all destroyed. Because they did tshuva, so you see that all the other countries went on the tubes. <laughs> understand? So that's that's a very very important thing. It's a very amazing thing to understand that this is the, uh, the, the, the. But the truth is right that even though the Jews are ascending, it's true, but still, you know, Esav is still more powerful than we are at this point. There's no question about that, right? So what does that mean? And by the way, I'm saying this for you, David. Why? Because. You know, we talked about this guy that you, you know you watch over there, this guy. So let me tell you something. This is what he doesn't understand, this guy. And his friends, by the way, all his friends. They don't understand that still Esav is still more powerful than we are. So we have to behave like that. You have to, the person has to be a little bit reality. You're talking about the... Yeah, the this guy, guy, yeah, in the basement. I, I, yeah. The, the who, I'm sorry? In the basement, in the basement, the guy in the basement. No, I think, the, uh, on the contrary, he yeah. says what you say. Yeah. Not exactly. Because, you know, I'll tell you what, what the problem is with these guys. Mm. With these kind of guys and all these guys. They, they think that we can do whatever we want now, you know? Like, you know, we can take everything we want, all the land that we want to take, we can take, you know? It's, we have like a carte blanche, you know? Like a, a blank check, you know? And whatever, whatever we, you know, we, we use, you know, Trump will write us a check for everything that we want. It's not going to work like that, you know? Even Trump was a very nice guy, right? Very good guy. He's not going to give you a blank check. If you think he's going to give you everything, you're mistaken. I didn't know you like. He's going to give you. He's going to give you. Listen, he gave us a lot already. He gave us a lot already. He's a good guy. You know. I mean, what can I tell you? You can't deny the facts. Because this guy hates Trump. The guy that I sent you. What can I tell you? But like, he gave us a lot of things already. You know, he's treating us in a very, very nice way. He's being a very nice guy, Mm. more than you know than anybody else has been. I think any other president Mm -hmm. in in America. So you know, you got to give the guy credit. I mean, you know, you got to give credit where it's due. You know, God bless him. God bless his family. Whatever. But what I'm telling you is that. Uh, nevertheless, we don't have a card launch. You understand? So the person has to understand that. You can't just take everything you want. You no. know, there's limitations to the power. Yeah. You know, even though Israel has a very powerful army, you understand? But you have to realize, once you put it into perspective, you know, like we're against, you know, this army and that army and Russia and France and England. We can't compare, you know, to all that together, you know, put that together. You know, we're not, that, we're not on that level yet. You know what I mean? Live in reality. Is that the, the goal? fantasy is, world. Is that the goal? Though? No, it's not the goal. Full of Jews not the goal. Take over the world. No, we're not, you know, we're not talking about taking over the world. What yeah. I'm talking about is that you know, a person has to understand there's limitations to how powerful we are. You know, we're still being ruled over. You know, somewhat. You know, by but, by. But the, you know, what is yeah. what does the Bible predict ultimately? What will happen? At that the means end? that we're still in Galut. You know, that's what the Bible is saying. We're still in Galut. We're still in exile. So we haven't mm-hmm. finished the exile yet. So a person has to know when you're in exile, you have to put your head down a little bit. Because know? the ultimate to realize what you where you are. The ultimate, the ultimate uh, ending to all yeah. of this is from what I heard yeah. you, ever since I was little yeah. that at the end Jews will. You know, flourish. flourish. That's so true. Take over the world. So we're, yeah, we're, well, you know, yeah, that, that's for sure. Yes. But and we're waiting right. for Mashiach. Yeah, we're waiting for Mashiach. But meanwhile, you know, what I'm saying, a person shouldn't get ahead of himself and think, you know, oh, now we can take that, we can take this, you know, we can kill these people, we can kill those. Rabbi, you believe in a Mashiach? You know, personally? we have to. Believe. If you don't believe, <laughs> you don't tell us something. Rambam says that you must believe. If you don't believe, 
you have like you're considered like a you denier. What, you understand? What your you have to personal. Believe. We have no choice. You understand? It's not like a, I have a choice. I can believe or not believe. I have to believe. So you believe. not only have to you have to believe, but you have to also wait for Mashiach. You know, hope for it. You know, in your heart. You know, that's the way it's, we're commanded on that. It's a commandment. You know, so it's a part of the Jewish religion. The Rambam brings it down as one of the you know like foundations of, of Judaism. You know that we believe in the coming of Mashiach because if it wasn't for that, now you ask know? Him if he believes yeah. in God. No, no, no. He knows I'm a man. <laughs> because the the Christians, yeah. for example, yeah. believe that he already came two thousand years right, ago, right. and we didn't okay. accept it. Right, and right. He's going to come back again. But this is a you know this is this is a this grandmother is story, okay? But you know yeah. it's, it's it's a nice fable, you know. It's like Santa Claus, you know. If you believe in Santa Claus, you also believe in baby and that also as well, you know. Same same, the same idea, you know. Just believe that Mashiach yeah. is coming. Exactly. A savior yeah. is coming. Yeah. Exactly. A savior. No, the Jews that yeah. that followed him. Yeah. And are responsible for. Yeah. Creating, you know, uh, his right, side right. of the religion, uh, claimed that uh, he came. They were waiting for the Messiah. We've been waiting for yeah. the Messiah since day one. That he came to free us from uh, from the Romans. Because yeah, I understand, we, yeah. but you know, but what what they claim, unfortunately, is not true. Uh, I'll, tell, mm -hmm. I'll tell you what the story is. Right, and Talmud talks about this this whole story. How did this whole start? Right, the whole story. I'll, and we'll end with this. Right, we don't have a lot of time. Yeah. So let's I'll tell you a five minute story, a couple, a couple of minutes, and we'll end with that. So it says over there, over there in the Gemara, what, what, how did this whole start out, this whole business? You know, what's, what's the origin of it? So the origin is like this, right? This guy, Yeshu, was, he was a Talmud, he was a yeshiva guy, you know, he studying in yeshiva. So the Rosh Yeshiva over there was Yeshua ben Parachia, was a big rabbi over there in the generation. Right? He was a big, big giant rabbi. So Yeshu was his Talmud, he was his disciple. You know what I mean? That's what happened. So what happened was that uh, it says in the Gemara that they now were, the uh, Yeshua ben Parachia, went to uh, Egypt to do some business over there. Whatever he had to do, I don't know exactly what he was doing there. And now, right, they're coming back from Egypt, right? So on the way, they stopped over at a hotel. Right? So Yeshua was also over there. He's his disciple, you know, coming to help him. You know, that's the way it is, right? The Talmud has to go with the rabbi and help, help him. So what happened was that uh, now they, they, they had this innkeeper over there, right? The lady who was running the hotel, manager, whatever. So this lady... She gave him like really good treatment, you know. She said, "So this was a big rabbi, you know." So she gave him big treatment, you know. Beautiful, beautiful, you know. Pumarili, you know. Beautiful food, beautiful this, best service possible, you know. Five star, you know, all the way. So what happened was that uh, after they, you know, they got this beautiful treatment. Next day they're about to leave, right, and go back to Eretz Israel. So Yeshu and the uh, Yoshua ben Prachia are sitting there, you know, together. So uh, Yoshua ben Prachia tells us, uh, Yeshu, tells him. Says, uh, you know, it says this lady. Don't you agree with me that she's like amazing? This lady, like the treatment she gave us, is like, you know, creme de la creme. Don't you agree? The rabbi says this. Yeah, this lady's amazing. Yeah. You know. So uh, Yeshu answers him a very strange answer. Right? What is it? What does he say? He says, yeah, but her eyes are. He says they're like round, like a like a like a ball. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So so Yeshu ben Prachia, he hears this. You know, he says, what are you talking about? So uh, he understood the implication after he thought about it for a second. What, what, what it was like this: like that. he, Yeshua didn't understand the, what he was trying to say. Yeshua and Prachi was trying to say that this lady gave us like a great treatment, you know, five star, and Yeshua thought that he was talking about her looks, her, her her beauty, you know, whatever. So he thought that he was telling him, "Oh, isn't this lady like the most gorgeous lady you ever saw before? You know, the most beautiful model." And he tells him, "Yeah, but her eyes are not, you know, they're, they're like round like a ball, you know." She's like, <laughs> so. Once Yeshua ben Prachia heard that, he got very angry at Yeshua. Why? What's the reason why? Because he said, ah, you're checking out girls, huh? That's what you do? You're a yeshiva guy? And you're checking out girls? So, and by the way, this lady was not only a girl. She was a married lady. You understand? She was married. Yeah. So because of that, it was even more severe. So, you know, I mean, if you wanted to marry her, that's something else. But she's married already. So, what happened was that he threw him out of the yeshiva. Yeshua ben Prachia. He said, you know what? You like girls? You're not going to be my yeshiva. I'm sorry. You want to be a playboy? Don't, not with me. So Yeshu gets very upset. You know? So what happened was that uh, now Yeshu comes back several times to apologize to the rabbi. You know, sounds like couple time days, right? The old good old days, right? So he comes back. No, uh, <laughs> that's a good one. <laughs> so comes back Yeshu. And wants to say sorry to the Rebbe, you know? You know Rabbi Katz, you know? Whatever, yeah. So, comes back. 
And uh, every time Yeshua ben Prachi pulls, pushes him away, he says, get out of my face. I don't want to see you. I don't want to look at you. You understand? So nine times he comes back like that. Yeshua, nine times gets pushed out. Right? And by the way, they say the Chazal that this was a mistake what he did, this rabbi. He pushed him out too, too strong. They say, right, that when you have a person like this, with a, with a weak character, you know, somebody who's not such a strong character, don't push him with, with two, two hands, you know. Try to bring him in also. They say, right, push him, with one hand push him out, and one hand bring him in, you know, like this. You know, yeah, but don't, uh, like this, you know. What is this, like football, you're playing football? Uh, what are you doing? You have to know, you know, don't push too hard. So this, was a, this was a mistake that he made this round. But in, 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 in principle, he was right, though. You know why? Because he really, you know, saw that this guy had a bad character. You know, whatever. So what happened was that uh, the tenth time, now he comes back again. Yes, sure. Tenth. tenth time. Yeah. You know? So comes back, and this time, right, Yoshua ben Parachia sees him again. Tenth time came back. This time his heart was moved. You know, he says, wow, this guy really wants to come back, I see. So he, he thought in his mind, you know, I'm going to take him back this time. So what happened was that at that time when he came, he was saying Kiyat Shema. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Right, he's saying Kiyat Shema. Takes about two minutes, right, to say it. So he tells Yeshu like this, right, puts his hands on He says, wait, wait, one second. Let me, let me finish Kiyat Shema, I'll talk with you. So Yeshu got misunderstood again, right? There's always misunderstanding going on with these two guys. You understand? So Yeshu thought, nah, he's pushing me away again, right? Now it was one right. finger. Yeah. <laughs> he, he thought it was this finger, right? Excuse, excuse the expression, right? So he started pushing me away again, huh? So he went... Right, and uh, this time he cracked this guy. He cracked. Right? So what happened was that he went and uh, went to a different town and started a church over there. Understand? Started to do Abu Hazaram. idol idol worship. You know, started to mock the words of the rabbis, mock the words of the Torah. He became a rebel. You know, became a bum. You know, became a loser. So what happened was that uh, now Yeshua ben Parachia comes to him. Right, he he saw what he did. Right, he opened up a church. You understand? So he comes to him. Uh, and he wants to bring him back to do tshuva now, right? So tells him Yeshua Prach. He says, "Listen, my son." He says, "I'll take you back. Let's go. You know, forget about this. Close down the church. Give me the keys. We'll put it in the garbage. Let's go. Let's let's start a new page, right? A new a new, a new, a new new chapter." So Yeshua tells him like this. He says, "I says I cannot do that anymore." So the rabbi asks him, "Why? What's the problem? I accept you with a full heart." So Yeshua tells him like this. He says, tells him. He says, I learned from you something, you know, and I'm going to now remind you what you taught me. He says, I learned from you that once a person causes the, the, the public to sin, you know, many people to sin, he says, they don't allow him to do tshuva anymore. They close the doors to him. So he says, I already caused people to sin. I opened up a church. So he says, now I, I won't be accepted anymore. He says, I learned that from you. What do you want from me? You're the one who taught me that. And by the way, it's true. It's but true. he didn't really open the church. He opened, he opened the church, yeah. He opened the, yeah I mean, like Abu Dazar, you know? A her heretical house, you know? Like they have today, the same thing. You know? But he didn't have the he opened that. Yeah, I know. They had they all kinds of you know, different, so, whatever they had and all these things, right? Exactly. But the whole idea was that to make a, you know, reform kind of, you know, Judaism with a different kind of, you know. In spite? Yeah. Or in spite, yeah. In spite. He was in spite, but it's also he had a bad nature. He was, he was a bad boy, you know, just like Esau was a bad boy. Mm -hmm. And by the way, what's the connection? Why do I mention this now? Because the, there is one big Nekuba, right? Rabbi David Wali was a book about this, about Christianity. He talks about, about this religion, how, what it does and what it, you know, all the all things. And he explains over there that it's all connected to, to, to Satan worship, to bringing down the powers of the Satan, the Christianity, right? It's a sat satanical uh, religion. That's what it is. He <laughs> explains over there. So he says over there, Rabbi David Wali, that uh, Yeshu was the Gilgul of Esav. He was the reincarnation of Esav. Okay. Can you imagine? This was the same guy. So, but it's not a yeah. coincidence that this guy has, you know, this Jew created two billion followers. It's not a coincidence. Yeah, two billion bums, you know, there's a lot of, all the, there's, you know, two, two billion losers, whatever. But the, the, most people are losers in this world, you should know. So that it's way. not true yeah. that, he, that he taught love and forgiveness and all this stuff? It's, it's not, there's, well, you know, it's, there's no merit to this I'll tell you all. something, he could have taught a lot of good things. By the way, every religion teaches something good. Yeah. You know, yeah. there's no religion that teaches everything bad. You know, but the problem is that when you're off, you know, what I'm saying once you go off the real, the real religion. So he wasn't you know, preaching. And you say the falsehood. The the church that he opened. Yeah. The alternative yeah. synagogue that he. Yeah. Opened, he wasn't preaching the Torah there. He was doing something like you know mi mixture, you know mixed bag, you know yeah. a little bit of this, a little bit of that, yeah, you know. Let, let's yeah, little, let's go. Yeah, yeah. You you know, yeah. Reformer, you know, reformer, you know, whatever. Yeah. So by the way, he knew this was this was also all false. 
He knew that it was false. That's the whole thing. You understand? Mm. That he knew the truth. He was a Talmud. He learned in Yeshiva. You know? So he knew what was the truth. How did he get all the secrets out? Ah, so I'll tell you what, what's the story, right? First, I want to explain, right, that Rabbi David Wali says that, that he was a Gilgul of Esav. What does that mean? That Akadosh Baruch Hu wanted to give Esav also another chance to do Tshuva. You understand? So he brought him back and did another Gilgul. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This time he brought him back as a Jew. Es Yeshu was a Jew. You understand? Yeah. But Yeshu was not so clean. What does that mean? He was a Mamzer. What does that mean, Mamzer? That he was born from a different, you know, his mother got impregnated from a different man. Right? She went swimming over there in the, in the water, right? And the, and the seed came, right? And from a different man who was swimming there and impregnated her. The seed was coming and impregnated. Right, exactly. So what happened was that he, Yeshu, was a Mamzer. What does that mean? He was an illegitimate child. You understand? So what happened was that Akadosh Baruch Hu now gave Esad, who was Yeshu, same guy, he gave him a chance now to do tshuva. What does that mean? That he brought him back with a bad nature, you know, because a mamzer has a bad nature, you understand? So they say, right, that he gave him a chance to be a, a savior, you know, like a messiah. Meaning what, if Yeshu would have done tshuva, if he would have been really a good guy, he would have been like a messiah, you know? He would have been like Mashiach ben Yosef, you know, the first messiah. That he had the potential to do that, you understand? But he failed. What does that mean? Like, by the way, Esau was also supposed to be a Messiah. Esau was also supposed to be a Messiah. But he also failed. You understand? So what happened was that Esau failed. The Kedosh Baruch says, you know, I'm giving you another chance. I'm going to bring you back again. Right? Let's see what you do this time. Right? So Yeshu, again, he messed up. You understand? The first time he messed up with Esau. It's Esau. Now he messed up, messed up over here. So what did he do? What was the story? The story is like this, right? Uh, that how did he do all these miracles that he was doing? You know, these, uh, they walked on the water, all this stuff, you understand, all these things, which is documented, right? They say what happened was that he was going to the Beit HaMikdash. And the temple was, at that time, was still standing. It wasn't destroyed yet. So what happened was that he was going in there, and, and every day over there, the, the Kohanim, the priests, you know, would come out and bless the people, you know, Birkat the Kohanim, you know, like we're doing the show. Something even more, even more, even more great. So, even more holy, right? So what happened was that they, but there's a difference between what we do now and what they did then. Now we do like with the regular name of God that we say in the Siddur, you know? But in, they knew the big name of God, the real name. Long, long, long name. So they used that name to bless the people and that had a very big power. You know, that name of God was very powerful. And if you knew that name of God, you could do miracles, you know, if you know how to pronounce that. So what happened was that the name was so long, it had like many syllables, you know, like I'm talking about, you know, like 45 syllables, you know, like, so it's like almost impossible to remember. So what happened was that they knew that people tried to remember this name and try to like walk out of there to, to make miracles, whatever. So the Kohanim were aware of that. So what they did was like this, right? That they, if anybody came in there and wrote something down, you know, to write that name down, once they heard it, to write it down. So when they, when they used to leave the Temple Mount, they used to get frisked, you know? To check if there's any notebooks there, any papers, you know, like this. Frisk him, you know? They frisked, and they would see if nothing is there, they let him out. If, not, if, if there's something is there, they take him and destroy it, right? They destroy it. Come and so uh, Yeshu knew that, right? So what happened was that he wanted to take that name to use to make miracles. You understand? So what happened was that he did something clever, you know? What he did was, he, instead of writing on a piece of paper, he took his skin, right? And he started to etch it. Right? He etched it with a, like, a, you know, with a needle, you know, like this. He etched the name like this on his skin. So he walks out of the Temple Mount, and they frisk him. Nothing there, right? They don't feel nothing. Syllable. All clean. Syllable right? by syllable. He exactly. He etched it etched out. Exactly right. That's what he did. So he etched it out. And then he used that name to make miracles. That's, the, that's, the, that's what he did, you understand? That's how he did it. And by the way, this is a very big sin to do that. To, to use this name of God, you know, to do, to, to do your personal things for yourself, to prove that you're right and the rabbis are wrong, you understand? This was a very big sin. And this is why they killed him, because this was considered to be like a capital crime, you know, all these things that he did. Where is this he, he, uh, uh, told? In the Talmud? In the Talmud, yeah, in several places. Told, by the way, it talks over there about how they killed him and so forth and so on. They, they judged him to death. And by the way, this is now... This part of the Talmud that they tried to judge him to death is, has been, has been um, what do you call it, uh, erased by the Goim when the, the Jews were in exile in Europe. They, they, the, they censored it. You understand? So what they did was they censored it out and they erased it. So it's like it's not there, you know, whatever? Because they didn't want people to know about what happened exactly, why they judged him, what the reason was and all this. You understand? So what happened was that there were some places in, in, uh, in the Jewish community, like, you know, Taman, Yemen, Yemen, you know, they're, they're, the censors didn't get over there. So in those, uh, in those areas where the censors never came, these remote areas, you know, they still have the original 
text of the Talmud, and now we have it, you know, because of that. So if you now, if you, if you, if you buy the original text, which was available, by the way, you can see everything, what they did over there, the whole story. How they they call the Talmud Talmud. the Book of Satan. You know, it's interesting. Yeah. We, we believe that we suffer because we, we don't do tshuva, but they believe that we suffer because we, we killed the... Uh, Right, which is a ridiculous thing, you know, yeah. I mean, it doesn't make any sense, you know what I'm saying? Uh, Actually, we never yeah. killed them, the Romans killed them. Now, the truth no, is the Jews we, killed them. The Jews judged him to death, the Sanhedrin, the high court judged him to death, just like we talked about, right? Yeah, In those days, there was a high court. Uh, no, the Jews did everything. They, the, the, the Romans no, they, supported they it. They carried Romans, yeah. they, they supported it. it. You know no, why? No, they killed them physically, but we, the Jews, sold them out. So the mount is one thing, but who yeah. killed him? Who put him on the cross? The, 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 the Talmud right, says they didn't have to kill the Talmud him, says that the, the, the Talmud says that the, the Jews high did. priest demanded. We demanded. It. It. Yeah. Watch Jesus Christ superstar. You're gonna see everything. The, the Talmud says that the Jews did it. By the way, it's not. It was not. The, it wasn't the Romans. But the, the Romans supported or, it. Uh, the they were also supported. Why? Because they Talmud considered says. to be a troublemaker. I didn't you mean, Rabbi. Yeah. I, I yeah. didn't mean to veer you off into this thing. Yeah. I'm very fascinated with this. Okay. Let's stop here.